the uh, craniocervical junction and the odontoid in elderly patients. I have no conflicts of interest. This is not a CME trauma. Basic workup, all of you know it, and this is a resident fellow specific thing. Always remember the ABCs, always remember the maps, and think about immobilization with sandbags as a very credible alternative. Kids should not be on a regular headboard. And again, uh, clinical clearance of spines is one of those traps when you see it in a question. It's never a, a clearance without a clinical examination, so don't uh, declare an image uh, to be uh, clear or not. And of course, all of you know and should follow the principles of determining a skeletal level of injury and a neurologic level of injury if applicable. And if there's a mismatch, dig deep. Finally, one of my pet peeves um, has been since uh, Parkland days uh, with Tim Adamson, rectal examinations. What drives me nuts is when I see rectal exam normal. This is not a factor. These are the four variables that basically play into this when you have a spinal cord injury patient that includes myelopathy patients. So nowadays you have to have a chaperone, you have to document it however, in a differentiated fashion because it's very meaningful if a patient has sacral preservation. Imaging is not always necessary. These are the five classic conditions. This is very boring basics, but I always want to point out you don't have to image everybody. Uh, these are the five uh, medical legally, since Kozier brought it up, um, accepted uh, parameters in which you don't have to get an image. The classic patients at risk for any question situation that we see are cognitively impaired patients, high energy polytrauma patients, and patients with an atypical anatomy. And finally, and this is the latest, worst um, uh, bane of our existences, the ankylosing spines and geriatric populations. They are uh, superimposed populations. And there are times right wide where we have a geriatric trauma service here now. We're not even a trauma hospital. It's just amazing what's uh, happening in the world now. These are the traditional parameters of trauma that all of you know, but that's kind of the statistically uh, validated threshold towards when a trauma has been deemed significant. These numbers are irrelevant in our geriatric population. Conventional x-rays remain important for alignment purposes, and again, you have to remember that most of the thoracolumbar trauma happens at the thoracolumbar junction, as identified uh, by Kojo. Lateral C-spine radiographs are still a very valid um, uh, entity. Uh, Bilal, in Jerusalem, do you still use lateral C-spines or do you go straight to CT? Straight to CT. So it's uh, getting worldwide acceptance. And remember the classic problems of this is a patient at Harborview uh, whose cervical thoracic dislocation was missed. Um, uh, this should be a rarity nowadays. He actually survived for about two weeks. So the screening CTs are the norm, norm now. Who should get them? Again, not everybody. This is a significant radiation exposure, even with helical uh, CTs. Uh, if you have any spine trauma, tumors, or infections, it's the norm now, Dave. And again, cognitively impaired patients, at-risk patients, high-energy injuries, abnormal screening tests, or peds and elderly are probably the best targets. MRIs in kids are a big problem, especially younger kids, because we do have to put them to sleep frequently. But they're obviously limited, but very effective for discs and ligaments somewhat, and canal and cord compromise. Now to the actual topic at hand the upper cervical spine, which is an amazing and intricate functional unit of three main bony elements, the occiput, C1, and C2, interwoven through several key ligaments, which I've listed here on the right side. You've seen a beautiful lecture of uh, Dr. Tubbs this morning, so I'm not going to repeat all these things, but these are classically the taught main key ingredients that keep these together. Before the advent of CT, most occipital condyle fractures were overlooked or not even studied. The Germans had a very complicated study uh, going on with seven subcategories. But this is what we were taught, and this is my faculty mem uh, mentor, Dr. Anderson, who came up with this. Type 1, uh, simple impaction, stable. Type 2, a problem fracture with avulsion. Type 3, a shear fracture through the skull base. So the craniocervical injuries have been a big problem for us for so many years due to a variety of circumstances. First of all, Dr. Trainellis is a great guy, and now in Chicago, as you know, uh, classified them based on direction of displacement. And why is this a problem? Because, first of all, 60% of his patients were missed in the beginning, and secondly, where, wherever you put the head, the, uh, the spine will go, or the opposite way, it's dislocated. So the direction of displacement had little to do with the actual injury. And these injuries are frequently complex because they're, again, a complex uh, uh, craniocervical junction injury. So you can have injuries that dissociate at one level and at another level, and it's not that simple as what he had put out. 
You can see these usually very nice NMRI scans due to hematoma, ligament disruption, and God forbid, cord signal changes. Why has this been overlooked so long? The classic studies, and this is Dr. Buholtz, who was my chairman in Dallas, many of these uh, uh, studies had identified a horrible survival rate. So these injuries were felt to be not survivable, and it was more a post-mortem uh, pathology interest. And of course, there are unsurvivable injuries where nowadays through better EMS, we have survivors, even with these catastrophic craniocervical injuries, where we then face very difficult family discussions in these survivors. Again, this was actually a patient who survived for quite a while. <clears throat> so the other untold story is the pediatric angle. All of you know that the heads relative to the body are much larger in kids. And again, we have better and better child restraint systems. And there's a lot of therapeutic unease about identifying the craniocervical angles and relationships and examining kids. And again, an MRI scan in this kind of a junior is a very difficult thing because you probably have to intubate them. This is a classic case out of uh, Harborview. It's a two-week-old child, was not moving after being shaken, brought in blue in face, and the diagnosis of this craniocervical injury was missed for over two weeks. Simply nobody was consulted about it. And, Again, finally, it dawned upon people that there was a catastrophic craniocervical injury. Now, what are the problems? There's been a historic lack of confidence and familiarity with this anatomy. And that translated into the, uh, or from the basic radiographic era to the present era, and we're just now starting to get more in tune with it. I find that regrettable for many reasons, but one of the classic problems is that it was made too complicated. We all had these myriads of radiographic lines for rheumatology patients in our heads and thought we needed to calculate those out when it in fact was not necessary. There's simple things like prevertebral swelling that tips you off, Wackenheim's line, the clivus should be close to the odontoid tip. If it's not there, there is a problem. It's probably not quite right. Something has dislodged or dissociated. Your anterior and here posterior example. This is another example of a problem, powers ratio. Do you all still learn that? Most people say yes, some say uh. This is worthless. Forget it. Scratch it. Chapman said so. I published more on this topic than others. This is really nonsense. It's never meant to be present. It can't calculate positively if you have a pure distraction injury. It's only meant for anterior translational injuries. And as I said, they can go posterior, they can go oblique, they can go in any direction. So forget this. Empty your hard drive from this knowledge and open up for other opportunities. Acute flexion extension x-rays. Something that is very effective in the cervical spine to determine stability. Forget it for acute trauma. This is not doable. This is too dangerous. Just the other day, um, I think uh, Zane Timchak and I took care of a guy who had flexion extension films done in an outside hospital. And he had an acute TAL injury. And they stopped only because his hands on both arms went numb. He had a TAL injury. And I think he had about the space available for the cord of about 10, 12 millimeters, something like that. He just totally dislocated C1 on C2. Uh, the MRI showed some signal intensity. He should have obviously never had this flexion extension film. It helped our decision making. It was a clear no-brainer C1, C2 orthodesis. But I was going like, whew, I'm glad I didn't order that. So this is a no. And uh, that's, again, a problem. If you want to get it, I recommend that one of us sits down there as the patient does this and is right there to basically tell him, OK, when your arms go numb, don't go further. It's a little bit difficult. So at Harborview, many years ago, we did a study. We had the largest number of survivors. And we looked at a number of factors. First of all, how many survived? And the number was pretty good. But this was the shocker. Delay in diagnosis, the initial diagnosis, despite a level one trauma center, was only made in less than a quarter of the patient within 24 hours. Some of these patients came from outside hospitals. The delay of diagnosis was substantial, about two days. And again, this was a pretty grim reality check for us. We published this in Spine. And this is a classic case. We basically tried to double up educational efforts. 17-year-old girl, high-speed car crash, 320 pounds, weird-looking fracture there. Uh, she had what was uh, basically deemed uh, either a, a clavicle fracture, a scapular fracture. She had shoulder weakness on both sides. Turns out this was a Bell's cruciate paralysis. You see the big soft tissue swelling in her neck. An MRI was ordered, which is appropriate. It was abandoned because she developed a respiratory arrest. Uh, this was the screening shot. It tells you the story. She had a completely torn apart craniocervical junction with a cord injury. And so this was the nice MRI afterwards, which shows the catastrophic cord injury there. This was a patient who had arrived in our hospital, and we, she was in a collar even. So 
Uh, we did an emergent fixation on her. She did extremely well. It's one of the more gratifying recoveries from an Asia B, so sensory only preservation, cord injury. But this was a missed injury. And this is despite having a very close knit community and good educational efforts. So we looked at different ways of testing this, and we think that the traction test, if you have any questions about an unstable cranial cervical junction, is vastly superior. Here's a normal on the left, and even with five pounds of traction, you will see an abnormal distance. And this is unstable, and this is a surgical indication without a question. So two millimeters or more is the problem. You can do this in a fluoro. The patient can be asleep or not. Uh, you get a neutral picture, you save it, you compare it to about five pounds of traction, and if you have that, you have a problem. Again, here's a traction test just to show you. You have to be coaxial to the C1, C2 joints. And if there's a gap in there, you'll see it. You stop traction, stop traction, stop traction, right? Right, Bazem, stop traction, you got that? And uh, then you have your diagnosis. The patient should be sandbagged because collars are not stabilizing. This is a cadaver study where we sectioned a variety of ligaments. And what we saw there was kind of very difficult to align with Dr. Tubbs' statements before because we actually saw that all these various ligaments only had a partial contribution to stability, but what completely disrupted these patients were the facet capsules. So if you have a craniocervical or C1, C2 facet capsule trauma, that patient is gonna be unstable. That's like the barrier or the tenant of last resort. If those are gone, you have a problem. And even unilateral tears were pretty problematic. This is actually in a, a post-mortem specimen where we had a uh, ala ligament tear, and on the left side, you can see the facet capsules torn. So this is actually well known, and we actually found an article from 1858 that identified what we had with many cadavers uh, and great pains and all sorts of stereotactic uh, probes uh, confirmed much later on. There are these capsule ligaments that if they're torn, that craniocervical junction is definitely a goner, and if you can document that in one way, shape, or another, that's probably a clear surgical indication. So five to 10 pounds is perfectly enough to show craniocervical stability, and it's an axial form, so it's very safe for the neural elements. And the craniocervical capsule ligaments are the third primary stabilizer behind the infamous uh, tectorial membrane that you saw before in Dr. Tubbs' excellent lecture and the ALA ligaments. And finally, if there is a question of craniocervical instability, it probably follows an all or nothing principle. If you have instability, it is unstable, you gotta fix it probably. So treatment is very simple. Recognize it, recognize it, recognize it. Sandbags, a big uh, sign, unstable craniocervical junction is present. This is a patient with an open femur fracture. We actually fixed the femur fracture. We put her into a halo, more about that in a second. We checked the reduction multiple times. We fixed the femur and then fixed her actual craniocervical junction. A word about halos, they're a distraction device. They cannot really effectively reduce the craniocervical junction. This is one and the same patient before and after reduction result. It does not really work. It's a temporizing agent. This patient actually was neurologically intact, hard to believe, but fact. And we actually took a rate to the operating when we saw this. This is again a dislocation, another halo patient, where we just could not keep the craniocervical junction together. And that patient went, again, straight to the operating room for a craniocervical reduction and fixation. I'm not gonna talk about the surgical principles. You'll be in the lab and we'll teach you all sorts of tricks. The principles are the same as for tumor reconstructions and complex craniocervical reconstructions. Stable fixation, in those days we used transarticular screws. Nice grafting, the grafting is frequently overlooked. A nice structural graft, such as the uh, famous Dr. Bowman suggested, and you can have a very nice solid fusion, and usually we don't have to go below C2. You can do this in pediatric patients also. We've published on that also. And again, with uh, only mildly adapted small fragment fixation systems, you can actually achieve a very nice fixation. So the pediatric skeleton from about age three is perfectly capable of absorbing 3.5 millimeter screws. So in summary, the red flags to look for in cranial cervical injuries are not some complex mathematical algorithms. CTs and MRI scans will usually show you what's going on, but you have to order them and you have to look at them. Unexplained neurologic deficits, like in that shocking example of that girl who had Bell's cruciate paralysis, is a clear giveaway. Severe preventable swelling, that's a dead giveaway. There's a problem. You gotta look very carefully. And unusual upper cervical fracture patterns where you're just not quite sure what you're looking at, like this distractive atlas fracture, that's again something that's just not quite right. Or this kind of a weird looking uh, atlas burst fracture with the uh, odontoid sitting somewhere in the canal. That ain't right. So these are 
These are the giveaways that there's a major problem, and this is not just a little unusual fracture. See this little fracture blib up there? That's the rest of your uh, pectoral membrane as it attached to the skull. Second topic, less shocking, odontoid fractures. You ready for this? Everybody knows this classification, right? Wrong. I could show you several studies that show that there is an ongoing war between what is a type two and a type three. I assure you that if I showed you a series of 10 cases, we have a test on this, you'd probably have a high level of disagreement. The basic nutshell thing is, if there is a true cancellous body involvement, it's a type three. Everything else nowadays falls into that type two conundrum. And again, that's the main problem for obvious biomechanical reasons. John Grauer from Yale did a very nice sub-analysis and helped us categorize it a little bit more in terms of comminution and obliquity of angle. That's actually very helpful. And so this has kind of cleaned up a little bit of the mess that we have between what's a type two and a type three. And obviously, we need to answer one basic question when we look at an odontoid fracture, which is that the TAL, the Barrow Institute did a great series of studies with uh, Curtis Dickman about TAL integrity. This is their study. And again, if you have a ligamentous TAL injury, regardless of what your odontoid fracture is, that's probably a surgical indication. If there's a true bony component, you have a chance with a halo to help it heal. But again, the second that the TAL is torn or impaired, you have a problem. Now. What's the real problem for odontoid fractures? I talked a little bit about fracture morphology, but the real problem is that we've had a major change in society. You know what I'm talking about? The aging of our society. This is a Harborview series, and you can see this blue bar just jumping up whilst the red bar is going down. What's the red bar? Those are the knuckleheads who drive in their whatever Porsche, or it's a, it's a Toyota Corolla, whatever, souped up, and they're totally high and whatever, drugs, alcohol, they crash their car and they have a nice juicy type two odontoid fracture and it's yes, this is a great case, right? Those days are over. They have airbags and they, they sit behind computers and they're Grand Theft Auto 25 and, uh, or Fast and Furious and uh, that's how they play. They don't uh, ride cars anymore. We are in the midst of a silver tsunami and we have no idea where this ends and I'm nearing 60 so I'm gonna be part of this so please take care of me. But these are the numbers. And uh, this is the problem. Again, age as a chronologic uh, feature matters almost nothing anymore. We have people who are literally just unbelievable. My father-in-law is 89. He had a five-level lumbar surgery. I mean, he went three days later, he went after Africa to build uh, the hospital that he's uh, building there, build an expansion on it. So this age paradigm has totally changed odontoid fractures. Because yes, you guessed it, the most common spine fracture in geriatric patients now is an odontoid fracture. And the age of high-speed velocity injuries causing odontoid fractures over. And we have more and more patients who are closing in on the centenarian date coming with odontoid pathologies. What's the problem? Two things. A, osteopenia and the target zone of the waist of the odontoid, which is a physiologic phenomenon for which we have no answer. And B, the odontoid is a pivot point for our craniocervical junction. Now, what do I mean with that? If you look very carefully, this is a classic case of a patient who has significant odontoid atlantal pathology. See that? There are significant osteophytes, and the atlantoaxial joints are significantly stiffened up through this ankylosing process, which puts the pivot point of failure right smack into the waist of the odontoid. So that's the problem, and this is a stiffening problem, and when you fall and twist your head, it cracks where it should. And again, fractures in over 70-year-olds now are mainly type two injuries, more females than males, and low energy trauma, which by the way, statistically speaking, is more fatal than high velocity trauma. Complications, obviously brutal, classically more than 40% mortality within one year, and complications over 50% have been reported repeatedly in the literature, and yet again, missed injuries are bane of our existence. Now, one of my favorite procedures I almost don't get to do anymore, the odontoid screw. This was spine surgery at its finest. Precision like what Dr. Ziegler showed before, clear decision making, super precise execution, minimal bleeding, maybe even less than in Dr. Ziegler's and Dr. Adamson's excellent hands, and you had fixed a fracture without fusing something. Absolutely fabulous. The problem is you had to, it was totally unforgiving. This is, note, not my case. This is a poor starting spot to anterior. If you don't do that right, it breaks out right away or sags out, so you had to really be super exacting. This patient had to be treated with a fusion, but it was a very gratifying procedure.
And we learned over time that there are a lot of fracture patterns, which are contraindications. And basically now, I got to tell you, we're in a situation where doing odontoid screws is a true exception, if at all. First of all, in terms of blood loss, it's awesome compared to any posterior procedure. But on this right-hand picture, you can see the problem, the retropharyngeal zone and the upper or the pharyngeal plexus. Aspiration and swallowing are a real problem in our target audience, which is now a geriatric one. So this is a really big deal. We found out that most elderly people have a physiologically denovated superior laryngeal plexus. So this is why they gag and aspirate so easily. And if you then add trauma of an upper cervical retraction in there, swallowing becomes a nightmare. And this, again, was shown in several studies that we've done, both in terms of swallowing and in terms of airway problems. So there's no question that all of elderly patients have swallowing problems, even from a fracture, even if you treat it non-operatively or from the back. But it gets really bad if you do an odontoid screw. Same here for odontoid screws. So basically, odontoid screws are an almost extinct entity, and I'll show you a study on that in a second. Now, what do we do? Halo was one of those things that has come and gone, and maybe it should still be around. These were actually, uh, this was uh, the parents of a patient of mine who had an odontoid fracture also, and she came and wanted to have a halo. We actually operated on her, but this is her dad and her mom in a Minerva cast. Both had odontoid fractures when they had a car crash. True story. So the halo is a great external mobilization tool, at least historically, but it does allow some motion. The complications of halos have been rap vastly, I think, overreported. This is in one of our studies through Rick Bransford. And again, the most common problem are, the problems are pin tract infections and loosening, by far. We did a survivorship analysis, and I forgot what the number was, but it was a pretty large number. I think, yes, yeah, see it there, uh, almost 250 patients prospectively followed up. And we could identify that if you could uh, uh, deal with a halo and have a good alignment for the first two weeks, your chances of actually completing the treatment successfully were actually pretty high. So this statement that this is a real problem don't apply. Now, of course, you can't do this in a patient with severe kyphosis, ankylosing spondylitis. There are a myriad of contraindications. But per se, if you made it past this blue line, the halo and the halo stayed in place and everything was good, the fracture stayed in place, you had a reasonably good chance of success to make it to three months. So the comparison studies that were done by some other colleagues now uh, showed again that there's no difference in terms of a hard collar and a halo. So for you as a board answer, basically for type 2 odontoid fractures, there's not a strong reason to use a halo anymore, but it probably still gives you a better chance for healing than anything else. A simple proposal for me is the following. If you have a neurologically intact patient with a minimally displaced odontoid fracture, put him into rigid collar, get a lateral x-ray recumbent, get a lateral x-ray upright. If it doesn't shift, send them home with it if they're compliant unlike uh, Kim's patients there who need to wait for a week for a collar, right? <clears throat> so does it matter if you actually get a union? This has been hotly debated. One of my partners, Bob Hart, wrote a famous paper with six patients that they did not need any, pro uh, that they had no problems with established unstable odontoid fractures. Now, the fine print was that these patients were over 80 and all of them were demented, and they still were living in nursing homes, but that's another factor. So there's, again, a small series of patients who's, who've survived with a neurologically intact uh, status for a number of years, raising the question of should we do something in geriatric odontoid fractures. Chris Kepler from Philadelphia did a nice study, and he could identify that there's indeed a small but present group of about 18% of patients who have significant new neurodeficits. Most of these were not headaches. These were spinal cord injuries. And these are 79-year-olds with known or unknown chronic odontoid fractures. So a small subset of patients will die or significantly alter their life with a fall. And again, I would suggest uh, the, my review of this paper uh, signaled, be aware of it and uh, understand the patient, see whether they have pain, see whether they're cognitively with it, and discuss the options of surgery or non-surgery. In general, the trend of surgical treatment has rapidly increased over time. This is a national study that we did, and we can identify that the no surgery option for odontoids is on the regress compared to the top right half, which favors surgery. The type of surgery has also changed dramatically, and over the years, we can see that number two, which is the harms goel screw, so the segmental fixation has become very popular, whilst number one, the odontoid screws, are really starting to become extinguished. And all the other posterior arch fusion techniques are just marginal existence. So we saw a really significant trend towards segmental fixation becoming the treatment of choice over several years.
Now we did an odontoid study with geriatric patients funded through AO Spine North America. Uh, we did this multi-center, I think 10 centers. We had uh, prospectively enrolled 322 patients with surgeon patient preference. And what did we find? We found that surgically treated patients by 30 days had a significant higher survival rate. A lot was done about did we kind of skew patients one way or the other? Of course, we had a surgeon preference trial, but statistically, we feel we had a very strong modeling effort, and we could really account for any differences, which are, by the way, relatively subtle. This trend consolidated itself by two years, and again, there was a very clear survival advantage for surgically treated patients in terms of C1, C2 fusion. So for us, this is a pretty strong argument in a biologically reasonably healthy patient who could tolerate a procedure to do a C1, C2 posterior fusion, and with that, help patient survival. One thing that we've seen in the interim, which is really interesting, is the so-called vulture neck. Do you know what the vulture neck is? If you have a geriatric patient with an odontoid fracture, any spine fracture in their neck region, after whatever care you've rendered, their neck will want to fall forwards. And what is this a result of? It's probably a myopathy. It's atrophy of the paraspinal muscles. So bracing is probably a really bad thing for elderly patients because they'll really fall forwards. And there's obviously a cone of effectiveness between the craniocervical junction and the cervical thoracic junction uh, that has now been started to be looked at by the ISSG. And uh, we just had a number of their uh, colleagues right here, including Chris Ames, who really deserves a great deal of credit for having opened our eyes to the importance of the T1 inclination angle for the overall craniocervical junction and our overall spine alignment. It all fits together. So this cone of efficiency of craniocervical junction over the cervical thoracic junction is a big deal, and braces are not innocent and just posturally induce a significant atrophy of muscles that then is very hard to remedy. And again, we had actually a higher non-union rate, again, with collars in our series, in part due to the shearing forward of the craniocervical junction. Finally, in terms of cost analyses, we're in an era where we have to prove what we do. And again, there's little question that odontoid fixation for younger patients is very cost effective from a so-called quality basis. The second that we start going into older patients, however, these equations start flipping around, and we can now put dollar figures onto healthcare politicians' tables in terms of identifying how much they want to spend. And again, there's no question that once you get, statistically speaking, from an actuarial basis into the octogenarians, it'll be basically um, a sixth of the efficiency of a fixation in a younger patient. So now putting you to the test, 82-year-old patient, let's just say it's your, God forbid, uncle, ground level fall, lives in a retirement home, community ambulator, supportive aunt, wife, hypertension, nothing bad, GSC 12, has significant neck pain, displaced odontoid fracture. Please, by a show of hands, who would want to put this patient into a collar and just see how he does? We have a posterior displaced, 50% displaced odontoid fracture. Collar only, please show me your hands. C1, C2 fusion. Odontoid screw. Good, you're with it. Jack, what would you do? Collar. Collar, why? Because it's neurologically intact and you've got a supportive Kojo. Do you have a microphone back there? Do they have dementia No, you can't call our uncle demented. He lives in a retirement home. <laughs> And he knows that the Red Sox are the best team in baseball. So what else matters? So it, I, I, I agree with Dr. Ziegler. My issue has to do with, is the collar going to cause more issues, aspiration versus, I you that. yeah. I showed you, it causes a vulture neck. Correct. Aspiration versus um, okay. even they fall in again because they can't see their feet with their, uh, but most importantly, you know, they complain of neck pain. And, and that warrants me to, to offer surgery. Let's ask Dr. Moise, who's just joined us from Detroit Receiving Hospital. Collar or not? Or surgery? Uh, I have to agree with Kojo. I think I would, you know, uh, we'd probably operate on this person. Um, if they, it, you know, it depends on if there are any other injuries. If this is all they have, we'd operate. Yep. So we did operate on this patient, and he actually did, this is an older case from Harvard, did extremely well and walked out, survived two years out. Now this is the aging of our planet, and again, some societies have to ask themselves, especially the deep red and brown ones, uh, where this is going on. Central Europe and Japan are just uh, inundated with geriatric odontoid fractures nowadays. And again, the difficulty is, as in this picture, which category do they belong in? I think the current fracture classifications have nothing to do with what these pictures represent. We have very, very sick patients 
and they're maybe just even in their 60s, and we have super fit mid 80 year olds. So the real decision making points are probably more or have more to do with a mini mental status and senility than with actual fracture patterns. Now I'm going to put you to the real test. So that previous case was just a warm up. 98 year old male. Three weeks status post, and this is actually erroneous, this is not a car crash, this is actually a true story, it's an ATV flip. <laughs> Neurologically intact. Three weeks out, he had the Ziegler treatment of a rigid neck collar. He did not like it. This is his neck now, and he's uh, not in a collar because he cannot tolerate the collar. He's in kind of a combination of uh, tubular socks and uh, some whatever uh, wadding in there uh, because they, they just couldn't hold a Miami J collar or something on him. Now, what do you do now? Dr. Ziegler, I'm bringing the microphone to you. We want to record this for posterity. Soft collar. <laughs> well, this is not even a soft collar. So you just you want to wrap this up and just kind of put that on his chin? <laughs> Dr. Adams. Soft collar. Whoa, cruel. What, what terrifies you? The 9-8? 98. OK. Um, Dr. Hart. Wait, wait, wait. Hang up that phone. You may be on call. You can't escape. You wrote a paper. You wrote a paper. You wrote a paper that you can ignore this. This patient is 98 and flipped an ATV, and it's a true story. Came from Alaska. The daily little hot uh, whiskey. Ignore, like what you recommended in your JVGS paper, that's the most quoted paper uh, for like a decade, or do something. Uh, so I'm, I'm playing catch up. I actually was in the next room eating lunch, so I heard you reference my paper, so I appreciate that. <laughs> it's a legendary paper. Uh, yeah. Well, so I got to say that, so just it's kind of comic relief. That paper was sitting around as a resident, and it was five patients, and it was probably the least work I've ever had in a research paper. And it, it's the one I get asked the most about. So I, I don't know what that I tells you about you clinical right. research. Yeah, I'll I'm getting. I'll tell you uh, okay, okay. <laughs> very good. So I'll start with that. But. Um, this patient looking at this, I mean, that's a, that's, I don't know how you classify that fracture quite. It doesn't look to me like a simple type two. Um, you know, uh, he's gonna be going back to Alaska. I mean, I, I think I would operate, I would go posteriorly and I would do as few segments as I felt I needed to, hopefully only see one C2. But this looks like, it looks like two, three is already ankylosed. I probably would include at least three. Um, I don't know, we'll see. All right, show of hands. Dr. Hart's surgical treatment in full reversal of his JBS paper. Raise your hands. Dr. Ziegler's and Dr. Adamson's collective unanimously decided on soft neck collar. Show of hands. Equipoise. Oh, well, we fixed them. And he was actually, the thumbs up are what he did in the recovery room as he rolled out. He was just thrilled as hell. And I'm happy to tell you he went back. He survived a year, then we didn't communicate anymore. But his secret to love. <laughs> But his, uh, his, his secret to longevity, if you want to know that, is I have to wrap up. The boss says I have to wrap up. I'm talking too much. A glass of hot whiskey with water every day. So uh, if you want to be 98 and ride ATVs. We have received message. We are ready in the lab. Dr. Mendel has. So we'll talk later more, but thank you.